Good morning, evening, afternoon, night, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Terminal Directive Cards. This is a new series in which kind of replaces uh, the typical pack reviews that I do by one-upping it. We feature one Terminal Directive card ep every episode and we'll not only do a theoretical analysis of it as we usually do in a pack review, we'll also try to build a sample deck and then bring it to JNet for practical testing. Today's card of the day is Egret. Egret. Egret? <laughs> Um, water burp. Okay, water burp. This um, water burp is seemingly good. Or is it? I argue that it's actually not as stellar as some of the other similar cards like Panchatantra, which also uh, adds subtypes to ice, or Parasite, which is also something that you host on ice, or even Tinkering, which uh, g makes a nice gain sentry but code gate and barrier. There are some glaring weaknesses, and we need to be aware of them in order to build a deck that around egret that counters all these weaknesses. So let's take a look at them. Uh, the main thing is that uh, water burp needs to be hosted, which renders it ineffective against ice such as magnum and titanium. It also takes up memory, which is a big problem. Unlike parasite, uh, which eventually ticks up to the point where it destroys the ice and gets discarded, egret doesn't do that. It stays on the board forever. So. Uh, you have to take this memory hog into consideration because you can't have a full breaker suite. Uh, at least not with typical memory limits of like 5. Um, they also cannot help with unrest ice which is actually quite a big downside. This is some. This is a weakness that isn't shared by Panchachantra or Tinkering, both of which can deal with unrest ice. And if you think about Parasite which also can't really deal with unrest ice, um, most Parasite players don't actually use Parasite to deal with Unrest Ice. Uh, typically, you have a Breaker Suite that can deal with face checks and then you Parasite the Ice later on. So Egret is similar in that regard. If you want to use Egret on the go, you'll need some tools such as SMC and Clone Chip, uh, which are paid ability windows that allow you to get Egret on the go. Now, let's look at the strengths and this will dictate the type type of deck that we'll be building. Um, this Egret is universally effective uh, on a lot of ice. Uh, Magnum and Titanium are obviously the ex exceptions, but for everything else, um, Egret will do exactly what you expect it to do. And this is actually quite important because uh, the Corp doesn't really have any much counterplay to that. There are no Corp effects that remove subtypes from ice as such. The only way the Corp can interact with Egret is to either fire program trashing effects or to trash the host ice itself. And this means that uh, you can come up with uh, if you can come up with a breaker suite as the runner, which allows you to transform your weakest links, uh, for example, a shaper might not be very good at breaking big sentries. If you can transform those big sentries into big code gates and then efficiently break them, you are doing a lot of work with that egret. So yeah, uh, turning uh, worthless jade into gold is what you want to do, and egret wants you to build a deck that. Uh, makes your strong s that really rewards you for picking a very good strong suit. So that begs the question: What kind of breaker do you want to use in conjunction in conjunction with Egret? I think there are not that many good ones. The best one would be Yog. This would make Egret pretty similar to Parasite, where you are effectively blanking the host ice which you drop an Egret on. If an Egret third ice is broken for zero credits, it is effectively blank. So it will have the same effect as a Parasite, which is pretty good. That is what you're aiming for. The problem is Yogg is only at base 3 strength, so you're not getting full coverage with Yogg. You need to pump its strength. Let's take a look at some ways in which you can pump its strength. I'm not going to list them all uh, in speech. You can have a look at them by pausing the video. But for this particular playthrough, I'm going to use Personal Touch. I think it has the least weaknesses of most of the other options in this list. And we can build a deck around this. Um, once I've picked this personal touch, the rest of the deck actually falls in place very automatically. Uh, personal touch has a limitation in that it's vulnerable to program trashing. If you trash the host yog, all the other personal touches will go down with it. So you want to protect against that and nothing does that more effectively than Sacrificial Construct, which happens to be also in faction. This invites you to play Claude as well, which synergizes very well with SACCON. So there you go, the deck builds itself. Um, having to assemble Yogg and a bunch of personal touches on it is very notable, noticeable setup overhead. You need to draw most of your deck to find these pieces and then have the money to install them. 
this invites you to play a, uh, an Econ and Draw Suite that is bursty in nature and can get you going quickly. And that's where the prepaid engine comes in. Finally, um, you want to actually have all three personal touches ideally before uh, you face check any nasty ice. So um, you want to actually be able to tutor up the personal touch. This means that you want to play Replicator, which is a hardware tutor. And this invites Haley as an identity choice because you want to be able to install lots of personal touches um, at once. I mean, think of it this way. Installing three personal touches costs you three clicks, which is a very, very expensive. Haley softens that blow by a lot. So yes, um, this deck just builds itself. So yeah, with this deck, let's see what we can make do with it in the playthrough. Today our opponent is Sync, and we begin with an opening hand with Diesel and Gamble. It's not the most ideal opening hand, what you really want is big money, like a lucky find early on, along with Replicator. Um, that Because a Replicator early will help you so much, because um, once you see your first prepaid voice pad, you essentially get all three, and then your economy just snowballs out of control from there. So I play Diesel Gamble, obviously. I run the Jackson here because I do not want my opponent to quickly draw into the breaking newsers, the or whatever win conditions they have. I don't exactly know what this sync deck is, but I have a feeling it's trying to kill me. Uh, so because I took the tempo here of trashing the Jackson, I was punished by hard-hitting news. This is really unfortunate. Not much I can do about that. I'll take the tags, but thankfully I do. I did open with a deuce as well in my opening hand. So this is a very good way to clear tag. Clear tag. Um, I net gained one credit and lost tag. So essentially with that one click, I... Uh, cleared a tag, but instead of paying 3 credits to clear the tag, I gained a credit from Deuce as well instead. So that's a huge uh, boost for me. I was not able to clear all 4 tags at the end of my turn, but it was fine because um, without 2 tags, my opponent cannot boom me. So I actually managed to stay out of kill range and I was able to clear the final tag on the last, uh, on the next turn. My opponent meanwhile uh, abuses my... Uh, time clearing tags to actually set up a scoring remote. I will, I don't see myself contesting it and I really do not want to be making runs right now because if my opponent has a second hard hitting news, I will be dead in the ground for sure. And I cannot afford to take the tempo hit of uh, face checking any nasty eyes such as Turnpike. Turnpike is incredibly good right now. Um, a little diversion from my deck and Egret, but wow, Turnpike is one of the most amazing pieces of ice right now. Um, unless you're playing Mimic, there's no good way of getting past Turnpike, and even then, most uh, of the time you'll be face checking against NBN because they go pretty fast. So taking a Turnpike hit is actually very painful. It costs you one credit from the face check and one click and two credits to clear the tag after that, with the high trace ba base trace of five. So yeah, uh, it's a very very good piece of ice, and people should be playing it more. Now, unfortunately, my economy is in shambles. Because I took such a big tempo hit in clearing the early tags, I was left... Uh, the money that I would have spent on setting up my rig ends up being clear, uh, spent on clearing tags, and I find myself clicking for credits a lot more than I should be. With no prepaid setup right now, I'm drawing frantically for it. And unfortunately, I seem to have used up most of my... Eco uh, event-based economy already. I did draw a lot. A deuces while, a dirty laundry, a gamble, a lucky find. Um, have not having even made halfway through my deck. So I did see a lot of early econ, which was good, but uh, there's no prepaid. So I'm going to struggle in the mid to late game when uh, I finally get my prepaids up, but I won't have any econ events left in my deck. So that's quite bad for me. My opponent, um, Isis Archives, this is actually quite important to note. Um, I will not have access to dirty laundry money anymore, which is not that big of a problem since I've already used two copies of the three in my deck. Uh, okay, here my opponent scores a breaking news, I immediately get a yog out because uh, close accounts was coming. So that would absorb the uh, close accounts money and therefore make it not worth it for my opponent to close my accounts. So this is good. Um, I managed to, at least I had the SMC out there, that was huge. I was able to get my main breaker out, the yog. So I was actually, I am actually setting up my board state and I did not allow my opponent to punish me on that. Now, unfortunately, my opponent gets a QPM score. So that's the second agenda for my opponent, and I'm in, f I'm flustered. Um, if my opponent 
has a 24-7 and a boom in hand, I'm going to lose the turn after. Not next turn, my opponent's too poor to boom me, but I need to do something right now. So, as much as I don't want to run right now, I'm forced to. I'm only on 5 credits, I can get punished very heavily by a turnpike right now, but I choose to run and I hit a resistor. I obviously have to end the run. I could install Corroder and try to run R uh, HQ again, but this will take a lot of credits away from me. Instead, what I can do is, because I'm planning on hitting HQ lots of times to try to uh, find the boom in the, my opponent's hand and trash it, what if I place the Egret on Resistor? Yeah, so I'm strongly considering that option. It's not optimal. I want to save Egrets for sentries, but in this scenario, when my life is on the line, I'm going to play to not lose, and that means Egret on HQ. This should buy me two runs on HQ, provided my opponent cannot rest the innermost ice. I'm really afraid of a turnpike at this point. Will my opponent show me any ice on HQ? That is the key question here. Yes, they do. Thankfully, it's not a turnpike. It's an IP block that I can barely get past. Exactly three credits allows me to uh, evade the trace, and we are both now bankrupt. Unfortunately, this means I can't actually, actually trash a boom should I access one, but I did not. I saw a resistor, and I clicked for a credit. We are both poor. This is really bad for me. I bought myself one more turn, because as you notice here, my opponent needs four credits to win. 24-7 boom is four credits, and that means I they need two turns to set up the credits that they need, and then one turn to boom me. So I did was able to buy myself a bit of time, but uh, I started noticing that my opponent ice R&D here instead of clicking for three credits, which you would expect uh, the corp to do. And the next turn where you expect them to click for three credits to go up to four credits, let's see what my opponent does. They are not clicking for all the four credits. Instead, they iced up their remote. This was a very curious line of play. This hinted to me that my opponent was not going for the boom. If they were, they would be simply clicking for credits until they reach, reach the 4 credit threshold. This informed me that my opponent was probably not on kill. So with that in mind, I'm going to slow down my game. Instead of playing aggressively on HQ, I'm going to set up my economy. A quality time draws me into the prepaids that I've been looking for this entire game, and I'm going to replicate them all. Two prepaids come down on the board, and I'm forced to discard. This is a very painful decision. Um, first, I discard the Corroder. I mean, first I discard a quality time, a duplicate replicator. You only need one installed replicator to make uh, magic happen, so all other copies of replicator are just uh, excess. Now, from the rest of my hand, it's a very difficult decision. I need all three personal touches, and I have no way of recurring them, so they have to stay in my hand. Clone chip is very important, and it's a substitute for getting Corroder back out. Levy needs to stay in my hand because I plan to use same old thing to recur uh, Lucky Fine. And I do want my third prepaid up sometime soon. So with that in mind, my next turn was set out for me and I had to trash my Corroder from my hand, which, which hurt. It really did hurt, knowing that there are so many barriers in my opponent's deck. So I'm going to play prepaid and same old Lucky Fine here, which will take up my entire turn. In the meantime, my opponent gets an Astro going in that remote. Jeez, um, I really should have contested that, huh? Now, as you might notice, I'm not actually that phase um, when an Astro is scored because I know that I have backup specifically in the form of the clot, which is still on the table. So I'm not that worried about fast advance just yet. My opponent can't win on a bill. Um, right now, I just need to set up my economy and I'm going to do so by playing a lucky fine. In two turns, two lucky fines gets me up to 18 credits. So this is the power of the prepaid econ engine once it's fully going. Um, it took me a bit longer than usual to get it set up this game, but I finally found my footing and now I'm in a commanding position, at least in terms of economy, being up 18 credits to my opponent's 3. But still, I have to be wary of close accounts, which can turn the tables at any moment. So I need to start locking down my opponent's remote. This is a huge priority for me. And the way to do that is to set up my personal touch yog, and then set up the clone chip so that I can recur egrets from the bin, that I can place on remote ice. So let's go. First things first, clone chip goes up, gamble goes up. Um, I'm gonna check the remote, the new remote, uh, make sure that my opponent isn't doing anything sneaky. And then that uh, calls off the end of my turn. Next turn, I'll be going for the personal touches. And once I'm able to boost my personal touch, uh, my yog up to six strength, 
that is the magic number. This is something I didn't really discuss at the start of the video, but one reason why I chose Personal Touch as my York booster of choice is because with all three copies, you go up to six strength, which is, which is the magic number needed to deal with most ice nowadays. Troublesome ice include Archangel, DNA trackers, um, tapestries, all these are the magical six strength. And so you really want a breaker that has six strength. They're not many good eyes at 7 strength. In fact, there are very, very few. So 6 is the magic number you want to be at, and I'm exactly at that number now. So now we are at the uh, feel good point of this deck, the point where you have clone chips and egrets at hand. No matter what eyes you face check, you always have the option of uh, getting past it for free with clone chip egret. My opponent shows a data raven. This is click 3, so I can take a tag and continue on with the run. With my opponent only on one credit, I am fairly sure that I can get past the last eyes without too much worry. So now Egret is on Raven. Um, unfortunately for me, because I'm up against NBN, they are their specialty is in ice with on and counter effects. This is something that Personal Touch York cannot deal with. So as such, I'm still taking the tags of uh, Raven tag on every remote run, but that's fine. I'm rich enough to take the tags. So I'm going to run again. This time I'm going... So from now on, I'm just going to assert complete remote lock. I'm going to lock that remote up as best as I can and um, check it every time there's a new item inside. It's worth it for me simply because all subroutines are free to break. All I need to do is to suffer the consequences of the on encounters, which are starting to stack up, make no mistake. Turnpike is now shown, so every single run will cost me one credit, one click, and three credits to clear the tag. So that's a total of four credits and a click per run. Pretty taxing, but at least I don't have to pay for the subroutines at all because the egrets are all camping. Uh, it's feeding season in server too, and the egrets are hungry. Um, yeah, they want to eat the ravens. They want to eat even the turnpike. I'm very happy with that. So yeah, this is where you notice that egret basically acts like a parasite. Data raven is almost blank. Turnpike is almost blank. They tax a bit, but um, I can easily overcome that with my superior economy. As you see, money is just flowing out of my uh, rig thanks to the fully set up prepaid voice pads. Now, because I know I'm going to run out of money soon, I'm going to levy right now, uh, essentially drawing me five, free, five fresh cards so I can quickly cycle through my deck again. And I draw boatloads of cash. Jeez, this is a wonderful, wonderful hand to behold. But there's one card that I'm really looking for right now, and that's Corroder. I need to find a Corroder. And I need to find it manually, as an SMC won't do because I'm hard up on memory. There's only one free memory left and I cannot afford to trash any of my existing programs. Why do I need Corroda? I figure that there are agendas that are starting to pile up in hand and I would love to have a shot at them. Now I'm going to poke archives here. I'm using Deuces Vault to uh, expose that resistor on archives and run there because I need a server to dirty laundry into and archives is the weakest. So I would like to have that option to dirty laundry archives to use up my prepaid cr credits. Uh, I, obviously I cannot dirty laundry into the remote <laughs> because it's super taxing, but if my opponent continues jamming stuff in the remote, you bet I'll toss a dirty laundry that way. So this is the magic of the deck. I'm not Winning per se, my opponent's on four credit, uh, four agenda points and an astro token to my one agenda point. But the magic is, my opponent isn't going anywhere. They cannot score agendas. Fast advance is out because I've clawed and set con, and slow advance is out because I'm going to remote lock them with my egret york setup. Here is it. Here it is again. I'm saving so much money on breaking subroutines. All I need is a single breaker, a single yog, and two egrets, and I'm all my way through. I see a quantum predictive model, there's nothing I can do about that, that goes to my opponent. But again, I'm not phased. Why? Because even if I help my opponent steal all three quantum models, they'll be only up to six points, six agenda points. They cannot win. They can't fast advance to win, and as long as I can keep the remote lock going, which I certainly can given my very strong economy, I will eventually pull out the win. Now I use my last prepaid credit here to get past the resistor archives. Uh, tracing through the resistor, I'm going to get my dirty laundry money and some free agendas while I'm at it. Yep, this is one thing you should always be aware of when playing against a sync deck like this that usually doesn't try to win on agenda points. Oftentimes they'll end up getting flooded and one common technique is to pitch agendas into a bin and wait for Jackson to come back up. The reason they cannot hold agendas in hand is because 
the hand typically contains a lot of useful uh, punishing operations like hard hitting news, boom, exchange of information. These cards they want to hold in hand means that they have to pitch agendas in the bin and hope that the runner doesn't check them. So as long as you keep them honest on archives, um, things will go very well for you. And very well indeed for me because they made the glorious mistake of pitching a quantum predictive model into archives. This uh, Being able to steal quantum predictive as the runner is huge. Um, this is one less agenda I have to worry about as the corp, I mean as the runner. In fact, I'm even more worried about quantum predictives at this point than breaking news because I know my opponent has no way of fast advancing breaking news. I'm so comfortable, in fact, that I'm still letting my opponent get that sand sand. Sand sand can stay on the table for as long as the game ends. I don't really care. I have a clot, I have set con, I have two clone chips in hand. The clot lot is real, you're not fast advancing anything out into space. That's for sure. We can clearly see at this point that Sync is struggling to get anything done. The satellite is grounded on the planet and I have successfully imprisoned my opponent. And this is how a control deck works, a control shaper deck. Um, even though it takes a long time for me to get my hardware rig set up, once I finally find all my personal touches on the York and the prepaid voice pads, I'm unstoppable. Because uh, the, resource, the resources that my resource efficiency given by my prepaids allow me to evade uh, punishments that my opponent has in store, like hard hitting news. Um, on the other hand, uh, the York and personal touches with Egret allow me to remote lock my opponent and run it every single turn without losing too many resources myself. In fact, I have so many resources I can afford to check HQ, to clear any booms, and to find any agendas for the win. I don't actually have to do this, I could just completely remote lock my opponent and wait for victory, but you know, I, you know, it's good to put someone out of their misery in a non-competitive game. So I'm, and my opponent jams something in the remote, there's no reason for me not to check it. Again, just look at my resources. I'm way ahead of my opponent and I still have a lucky find in my hand to boot. This is a very effective demonstration of how to <laughs> completely remote lock your opponent. Being able to run the remote every single turn and still keep afloat uh, means that as a corp, you are basically doomed. And this is the objective of many runner decks nowadays, with an inevitable late game and the ability to lock remotes. Of course, locking remotes is not as simple as having enough resources and an efficient breaker suite. Um, I needed to have clot set con in order to prevent my opponent from winning via a third win condition, which is fast advance. And my opponent just realizing that decides to spend a turn purging virus counters. So they are kind of putting the clock on me, because if they keep purging for the next few turns, they will be able to eventually score out their bill or their astro uh, or uh, breaking news. So I need to prevent that, but that's fine because I know that I have a lot of time. My opponent thinks I only have two turns to live. They only need to get two purges to win, but that's not the case because I have double clone chip in my hand, which extends the number of purges needed by my opponent by two. It doesn't matter anyway because I run archives for the win, my opponent stash a food in there and I steal it. So that was a pretty convincing victory. That said, we must keep in mind that this is actually a very favorable matchup for the York Egret suite. Um, this particular sync deck, my opponent, had not very many ice, so as such, they were unable to find a critical mass of ice to dump on the remote to tax me out. They only had uh, Turnpike and Data Raven to work with, which were simply just wasn't effective enough. If they were able to force me to get another Egret on the board, that might have made things more difficult for me. It's also important to note that Sync had the advantage for most of the early game. They were able to get up to 4 points with absolutely no impedance from me. And this is one of the weaknesses of my deck. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately for my opponent, they built their deck in such a way that they were not able to uh, capitalize on the early game to punish me for my uh, lack, of threat, lack of threat. So uh, they, end up, they end up getting stuck, which is what you often notice with uh, such matchups against control decks, you just uh, fizzle out uh, towards the end of the game. So with this Young Egret deck, we can definitely see some problems that you might face in other matchups. Uh, we didn't see it in this playthrough, but uh, I'm sure you can. You are imagining some of them right now, and probably are about to type them in the comment section. One of the most notable things is that this deck is very weak against uh, ice stacking. You can only mark uh, three pieces of ice with Egret, so uh, sentries are a big problem. Uh, if you look at my deck list, this deck doesn't actually contain any killers at 
all. So if you imagine an R&D that is like triple stack R&D, uh, architect, for example, that is not a palatable server for me to run at all. And yes, it is true. Um, uh, this could be seen as a problem for the deck and a lot of you might be saying, hey, should I include this Sentry Breaker or this Artman as a backup? And my answer is, well, it depends on how you look at it. Um, the lack of a good answer to Sentries could be seen as a bug of the deck or it could be seen as a feature. Um, this deck is, su is supposed to subdue Sentries with Egret uh, converting them into code gates that allow it to break for free. Um, if you are in a meta where there are too many sentries being played, everyone loves playing 10 copies of sentries in the corp decks, maybe this is not the best runner deck to bring, just saying. So not all problems need to be fixed, you just have to be aware of what problems that your deck has. You simply can't cover everything. Um, it also should be noted that Egret cannot be easily repositioned, which typically ends up restricting your lines of attack to only one server, as in this game, where I could only run... Uh, my opponent's remote for most of the mid game uh, until I got my corroder up that was the only server I had any line of attack on uh, thankfully um, <laughs> it was a pretty important server I identified the right server that needed to be suppressed and as a result my opponent uh, opponent's progress came to a halt um, in outside of the context of this particular Haley deck um, one might think that Egret might be a suitable backup breaker in the as yeah in the same vein as Artman is in typical shaper decks where you include just one copy as a backup emergency breaker for ice that you weren't uh tacked against so for example some shaper decks don't have a proper ki killer for high strength sentries so they would struggle against ice like Susano no Mikoto uh some shaper decks might struggle with tour guide having too many set routines as well these are just some examples of ice that you would like to have a backup breaker for so how good is Egret as a so-called backup breaker in these situations? Uh, when you drop an Egret on these sentries and then break them with your Gordian Blade or your Corroder? Well, you must first consider how much more efficiency does the Egret lend you. Um, if you're breaking a Susano with Gordian Blade and Egret, for example, you're still paying a whopping 6 credits per run. That is very inefficient, and do you have the resources to sustain multiple runs on that Susano? If the answer is no, then maybe Egret isn't the best backup breaker. Maybe you should think of using that slot to play some other vector of attack. Maybe a card that uh, pl places pressure on another server, such as, you know, if Susano's on R&D, maybe you should be playing Legwork instead, so that you can attack HQ instead of trying to ram your head into a Susano that you would never meant to break anyway. Same thing with tour guide. Um, there's not much point in turning a tour guide into a barrier or a, cent or a code gate if you have no efficient way of breaking it. So basically what I'm saying is, unless you're playing Yogg with Egret, um, Egret doesn't seem uh, very sh stellar as a backup breaker. So yeah, uh, some interesting things to think about. Um, Egret is definitely a very interestingly designed card that has potential to blank a huge swath of the opponent's ice if you build your uh, Egret deck in the way that I did with Yogg uh, breaking subroutines for free. It's so ridiculous. Well, uh, hopefully it's an interesting deck idea. You might want to try it at your next game night kit. In the meantime, thanks for watching and as always, happy net running. I'll see you next time.